Well, I'd like to thank everybody for coming here tonight. Um, originally, uh, Dick was planning on being here last week for the Iowa-Iowa State game. And I said, you know, we might want to reschedule this one. <laughs> so uh, thank you for being here. And uh, Dick uh, came from Princeton, Illinois for this program. And uh, he spent uh, over 40 years working for Coca-Cola, and I'll let him explain all that. But uh, uh, he's excited to be here, and I'm excited to have him because our house is full of Coca-Cola stuff. And uh, so it was really exciting to, to have him uh, scheduled to come here. And he got here a little earlier, so I was able to, to learn a little bit uh, behind the scenes of why did, well, I'll let him tell you all this stuff. So I don't, it's, the program's not me. So, uh, please welcome Dick Boker. Thank you. Hey, thanks, David. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Great night in Iowa City, right? I used to get down here quite a bit because I had a daughter that graduated here, and I had two grandsons that graduated here, and there's one down here now. So we know Iowa City, and we appreciate the university here very much. My name is, as David said, Dick Volker. I did spend 40 years or so at a Coca-Cola company in sales management. But, you know, back in the late 1880s, there were a lot of things going on in America. The Statue of Liberty was being unveiled, welcoming immigrants to the United States. There was phone service between New York and Chicago. The Canadian Pacific Railway and England's six-mile-long Severn Tunnel were completed in those days. Now, that was very important engineering because it opened up regions to trade and travel. Then, I'll bet every one of you in here sometime in your life used a push-button camera. Who invented the push-button camera? The inventor of the pushing a button camera was George Eastman. Remember Eastman Fodak, Eastman Kodak. He did that and he along with Thomas Edison invented movie film, the first film that came out for movies. Then, now probably everybody about the time they were in the fifth or sixth grade, they were assigned a book from school written by Robert Louis Stevenson. What book did Robert Louis Stevenson write? Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Then there was a guy by the name of Arthur Conan Doyle. He wrote a different kind of literature. What did he write? Arthur Conan Doyle. You got it, yes. Sherlock Holmes, The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Were you a teacher? I don't think so, but anyway, anyway, okay, so there were a lot of things going on in, in our country here. Steamships were bringing in people, phone lines were working, and everything was going well in the United States. But, down in Atlanta, Georgia, Dr. John Pemberton. Dr. John Pemberton had been a lieutenant colonel in the Confederate Army, and he suffered a severe saber slash across his chest. And after recovering from that, he went to what they call in those days, pharmacy colleges. He wanted to be a pharmacist, a druggist, and he became one. And he worked in Atlanta, Georgia, in Jacob's Pharmacy, Jacobs Pharmacy is in the National Registry of Buildings in the United States. It's on Peachtree Street. One night, behind his 12 Marietta Street red brick home, he had a cauldron, and he was mixing up syrups. He was the kind of guy that he had a lot of pain in his body, and he'd take opium and he'd take all kinds of different drugs to try to alleviate his own pain. One night he's down there mixing up this syrup and he takes that syrup the next day 
up to his Jacob's Pharmacy, and he starts selling it in four, four, four and a half ounce bottles to ladies coming in wanting something for baby colic. The first purpose for Coca-Cola syrup was for baby colic tonic. Okay, now you know that every drugstore in those days had a long, 25 foot long soda fountain. You remember, they have a draft arm here for carbonation, for the sodas and that, draft arm over here for water to drink. Well, in those days, there were two refreshment drinks. One was sarsaparilla, which you would call root beer, and the other was green, who said that? Green River, you're right, you get a cigar. <laughs> green River, there were two drinks in those days. There was root beer and there was Green River at these soda fountains. So, one day, this 17-year-old young man, Willie Venable, Willie Venable had his white hat on and his white jacket, and he's taking care of the customers this afternoon at this drugstore. So, he takes a six ounce glass and he puts one ounce of Coke syrup in it and he fills it with plain water. And he gives everybody up and down the counter a glass of that. Then he takes another six ounce glass and he puts an ounce of syrup in it and he puts carbonation water in it, carbonated water. And everybody, again, we call it sampling. Everybody got two different kinds of tastes. They got the carbonated drink and they got the plain water drink. Well, the consensus that day was that the most of the people liked the carbonated drink best. So, this drugstore also had a bookkeeper, a man by the name of Frank Robinson. And Frank Robinson kept the books and he was a good marketer. He's a good businessman. Hey, can you remember oil cloth? You remember oil cloth? Stand up. <laughs> this lady here represents Coca-Cola. Very nice. I have never seen one like that. That is very nice. Very good. Very good. Thank you. You sit down now. You got it at Target. Really? Do they sell nice sweaters like that? Oh, my. I bet that's warm, isn't it? Good. That's the idea behind it, isn't it? Well, let's see. We were talking, we were, we were talking about uh, this guy, Frank Robinson. And Frank Robinson takes, we talked about oil cloth. You remember oil cloth, right? Anybody remember oil cloth? My mom's kitchen table was covered with oil cloth. So, Frank Robinson, after he seen how well this drink was received by the people, he takes a piece of oil cloth. Now, in those days, the style of writing was Spencerian script. Spencerian script. Hey, do you know that they don't even teach cursive writing in schools anymore? Isn't that terrible? I hope so. Good. Back in 1886, Spencerian script was the style of writing. So, Mr. Robinson takes this piece of oil cloth and he goes C-O-C-A dash C-O-L-A five cents. And he goes and he puts it on the front window of the door. First piece of advertising on Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola, five cents. Now, two weeks later, in the Atlanta Journal magazine, or newspaper, they came out with an ad, come to Jacob's Pharmacy and have a Coca-Cola. 
delicious, refreshing, invigorating, exhilarating. That's the way it was advertised. Delicious, refreshing, exhilarating, invigorating. Five cents. So they started merchandising the product and getting it going. And uh, I will have to tell you that the first year it didn't amount to much. They sold 25 gallon of syrup. Now that's the syrup, not the overall drink. They sold 25 gallon of the syrup, which equated to 2,300 drinks because we're doing one ounce of syrup, five ounces of water, 2,300 drinks. So they took in, they took in 50 bucks that year and it cost them $78 for the advertising. So that, that was the way it got started. But anyway, this man, John Pemberton, he was well liked and he did well. And as I said, he was suffering from these saber injuries he had in the war. And he would be taking cocaine and he'd be taking opium and everything to try to alleviate his own pain. We mentioned the word cocaine. Many times when I speak, people will come up afterward and say, did Coca-Cola really have cocaine in it? And I would say, yes, it did, up until 1917. It did have touches of cocaine in it because the formula for Coca-Cola is, and I'll tell you that right now, any high school chemistry teacher can break down what's in a Coca-Cola. There are extracts of coca leaves and cola nuts. Now the coca leaf is what the cocaine came from and other fragrances of the coca leaf. Now they still use some of the extract from the coca leaf, but not cocaine. In 1917, the United States government says, you got if you're gonna be a soft drink, you gotta take the cocaine out of there. They did and it's been a very successful company ever since. So anyway, the product has extracts of coca leaves and cola nuts. Now, cola nuts are where you get your caffeine in the morning for coffee. Cola nuts give caffeine off. And so it also uh, is involved with Coca-Cola. Soft drink, any soft drink has got some caffeine in it. Then you got in the product also, you got caramel coloring, you had phosphoric, uh, pre for a preservative, you had phosphoric acid, you have cane sugar in the olden days. Nowadays, all these soft drinks have, and I don't know whether I pronounce it right or not, but it's fructose or fructose or whatever you want to call it. Because since the 1970s, 1970s, Farmers had such large yields on their corn, they needed something to do with the corn. So they started manufacturing corn syrup and fructose. Any drink you serve now with soft drink is going to have some fructose in it. Well, there's one exception to that, but we'll talk about that later. Okay, so we got in the product, we got caramel coloring, we got cane sugar in the olden days. Now up until the 70s, you had cane sugar in it. When I started with Coca-Cola, they introduced me to the manufacturing location, 1032 South Pulaski Road in Chicago. They had large rooms with stainless steel walls, and they had heaps of sugar in there, like farmers have seed corn or corn or beans. Just a lot of, a lot of sugar, because that was what they were using it. However, since the 70s, they don't use that anymore in America. Okay. So we've got extracts of coca leaves, cola nuts. Oh, incidentally, if you look in the dictionary, the word cola starts with a K, not a C. But this, this Frank Robinson, he was into what we called, um, he was into a type of light language that uh, it was called alliteration. And what alliteration means, if one word starts with a C, then the next word has to start with a C. Or if one word starts with any letter, the next one has to. So you had coca starting with C and you had cola with 
uh, that went on like that Coca-Cola to get the seas in it. So, okay, we've got, now we've got carbonated water, we've got caramel coloring, we've got phosphoric acid, we have uh, fructose, we have extracts of coca leaves and cola nuts. That is what is in the syrup and, and the drink Coca-Cola. Well, we're getting on now, we're gonna talk some more about what was developing, because back in those days, we're talking in 1886, May 8th of 1886 was when the Coca-Cola first was developed, developed. So, okay, since then, things have happened a lot, and other companies started manufacturing cola also. Druggists, other druggists said, well, if Pemberton can do it, we can do it too. And a guy down in New Bern, North Carolina, by the name of Caleb Bradham, he developed a product, and you'd know it and recognize it as Pepsi-Cola. So back around the turn of the century, there were quite a few lawsuits because Coca-Cola had registered the word Coca-Cola, and uh, these other companies were using the word cola. I don't mean just Pepsi, there were other ones also, and so there were, there were around 1900 to 1910, there were quite a few lawsuits because Coca-Cola was wanting to protect their rights with their trademark product. Well, what happened was three companies were given the rights to use the word cola. Royal Crown Cola, which is an excellent drink and an excellent company. Pepsi-Cola, which is an excellent drink and an excellent company. And Coca-Cola. Everybody knows Coca-Cola. So, those things did happen. Now, you got to remember back in the late 1880s, it was known as the Victorian Age. The temperance people had closed all the bars down in Atlanta in uh, 1885. That was a year before Coke was developed. The bars were shut down, so soft drinks were a big thing. People would go, women would be happy to go into a soda fountain and have drinks, whereas they probably would not be interested in going into some of the bars and uh, have their social life there. So it helped Coca-Cola also because the booze was out for a few years and soft drinks were more or less in. Okay, now we're going to talk about uh, continuing forward. The uh, uh, we're going to talk about how the bottlers got involved. But, bottlers got involved in this manner. There were two guys that were from Chattanooga, Tennessee, and they both liked going to ball games. Now, I don't mean Cubs, Sox, Cardinals, I mean local games. And they got to thinking of one another, wouldn't it be great if we had Coke in a bottle so that we could wash down our popcorn or our hot dogs. So they go down, by this time, Dr. Pemberton had passed away. Pemberton died in 1888, and a guy by the name of Asa Candler came into Atlanta. They claim he had about a dollar seventy-five cents in his pocket, and he worked hard, and he built himself up a business called a pharmaceutical wholesale company, and he would sell items to the drugstores around the area. So anyway, believe it or not, Pemberton's family, after he passed away, they wanted nothing to do with Coca-Cola. Didn't want anything to do with it. So this man, Asa Candler, purchased the Coca-Cola, all the rights to Coca-Cola. The formula, the advertising, anything involving Coca-Cola, including the patents. How much do you think Asa Candler paid for all the rights to Coca-Cola? $2,300. $2,300 he paid for all the rights to Coca-Cola. In those days, that was a lot of money. That was quite a bit of money. But anyway, he now, in 1888, he bought the, the rights to the company. So, these two young lawyers came down there three times 
to talk to him about getting the rights to franchise out the bottling. And each time he told him, no, we're doing well with what we're doing, we don't want to do that. Well, anyway, in the meantime, a guy in Biloxi, Mississippi, by the name of Joe Bidenhorn. Joe Bidenhorn was a chocolatier. You know, chocolatier, uh, at this time of year they make chocolate Santa Clauses, and at Easter they make chocolate rabbits, and in between they play like they're Flanny Mae. Well, anyway, this Mr. Bidenhart, he had a, a chocolate shop, and he had a soda fountain in there. And one day, some guy like me came in there and sold him on the idea of putting in Coca-Cola. And he did. So, he had a boat. And he would deliver merchandise up and down the Mississippi River to plantation owners. They'd call him up and they'd want so much of this and so much of that, and the boat would deliver it to their plantation. Well, Mr. Bidenhorn, he got to thinking, what if we put Coca-Cola in a bottle and sold it and delivered it? Now this here is a bottle. My wife got this somewhere at a garage sale, but the concept of it is it had a cork on the top and a wire around it so that the carbonation wouldn't put out, push out the drink. So, what Bidenhorn did, he would take a box of about 12, put 12 of these in that box, and they'd sell them up and down to plantation owners and also to people around Biloxi, Mississippi. This was the first kind of container that they used. So, these two young lawyers, after being told three times that they couldn't get involved with bottling it, they went back another time a year and a half later, and finally Mr. Uh, Candler said, okay, you can bottle it. If you want to bottle it, you bottle it. So the way they did that was, um, Benjamin Thomas had everything to the east of the Mississippi River, and Joseph Whitehead had everything to the west of the Mississippi River. The, the, the river was a divide, the Mississippi was a divide. Now you're thinking to yourself, well gee, Thomas got the best deal of that because the population was all in the east then. But that didn't bother Whitehead because he knew the temperature and the climate in Arizona, Nevada, California was very warm. People were moving out there and it didn't bother him that he didn't have the advantage of as many people living there at the time. So, these two guys, they had the rights now to bottle cocoa. They were the first franchisers. It wasn't Hardee's or McDonald's that were the first franchisers. These guys were the first franchisers. And what would happen would be, Asa Candler would sell the, uh, the product to them and they would distribute it to local distributors. So, they got the rights now to bottle Coca-Cola, but you gotta have resources to build these bottling plants, to pay for trucks and equipment and, and uh, employees. So, and you won't believe this, you don't have to, but it happened. They would run in reasonably sized towns, like we'll say in Iowa City, or a Chicago, or a Springfield or somewhere, they would put an ad in the paper and it would say, want a Coke contract, and then a phone number. And entrepreneurial type people and people with some money would buy into that and they'd each get so many counties to work. You'd maybe get five or six counties, you'd get five or six counties. Everybody would get five or six counties that bought into this and they would develop them. They'd put in their money to build a bottling plant and pay for the employees and the trucks and all that stuff. And that's the third down the line. So old Mr. Candler, he's selling rights to these two young lawyers. They're passing it on to the local distributors. That's the way that it worked. That's the chain reaction. Well, anyway, you had to have containers. So there were six different companies that manufactured bottles for Coca-Cola. 
This here was a type of a bottle. Now this bottle here is straight sided. All the sides are straight on this bottle. This was an early type of bottle and it says on it Coca-Cola Company. Then later on, as the business got better and developed, they had a bottle like this. And this is also a straight sided bottle. And it has embossed on it there, drink Coca-Cola. A few years later, they came up with a bottle like this. Now this type of bottle here, you see a diamond on there, a, an advertising diamond, a trademark there. First off, with this type of bottle, they had a paper diamond, or wrapper as we would call it, paper advertising on there, indicating what it was. But the problem was there, many service stations and grocery stores would take a big water tub, wash tub, load it with ice and jam those babies down in it. And when somebody came to buy a Coke, they'd pull that out of there <laughs> and the wrapper would be off of it. The, the paper wrapper would be off of it. So then they decided to put it on with paint. And this is another type of a straight up and down sided bottle. Now also, by then there were quite a few people involved with Coca-Cola and if you were in a grocery store or somewhere where they had soft drinks on the shelf, you may reach in there and grab something and it may not be a Coke, it may be some other product because the bottles all look alike. So Coca-Cola didn't like that idea, they wanted to have something unique and distinct. So what they did, they set up a contest for the six different bottling companies that were making bottles, I mean the bottle manufacturers. They set up a contest for them. They asked them to come up with a design that was unique and distinct and so that if you reached in the refrigerator in the dark and you grasped that bottle, you knew it was a Coke bottle. Or if you're in a parking lot and you see a broken bottle down there, you could recognize that as a Coca-Cola bottle. Well, over in Terre Haute, Indiana, the Root Glass Company, they made a lot of bottles, they made a lot of money on Coca-Cola. Root Glass Company had a glass engineer, and a glass engineer is a guy that designs all different kinds of glass objects, not only bottles, but other water glasses and other types of glassware. So Earl Dean took it upon himself to design a bottle that was unique and distinct. And this was the type bottle that he designed. Back in those days, before you ladies, women wore tight skirts. They called them hobble skirts. And when they walked, they wiggled because there was a hobble to it. No joke. And this bottle, the lower part of the bottle, reminds you of the hobble skirts of a lady. The winding of the bottle changes it also. And what we used to do was call this a Dolly Parton or a Mae West bottle because of the shape of it. So you got a bottle that you can grasp firmly and it's a different shape. Well, they Coco approved this. They liked that bottle. However, if you've been around any bottling plants or been in, you know, those bottles come along on either a belt or a track and they're spinning around as they're being filled. Well, the bottle was too wide. It drug on the side of the equipment, slowing down the production. So, Mr. Dean goes back to work and he comes up with a bottle that you all recognize and know is internationally known trademarked all over the world as a bottle of Coke Cola. This is a six ounce, six and a half ounce bottle of Coke. And that's like you'd get now if you were buying bottles. So, these guys got all these distribution centers going on. And it's just like today, the beer distributors, the soft drink distributors, they have certain territories and they work them. So back in the, in the late 20s or 30s, 
You won't believe this, you don't have to, but it's true. These bottlers would hire women to go house to house offering the lady of the house or whoever came in the door, they'd offer them six bottles of Coca-Cola. They had them in six, six bottles in a container. They'd offer them six bottles. So I'd come to your home and I'd say, hi, I'm Susie Smith with Coca-Cola. We're a new product on. I'd like to have you taste some of that. I'd like to give you six bottles of Coke. Oh, thank you. Oh, by the way, can I put this on your wall? Can I put that on your wall? You all seen these beer companies have them, soft drink. And she'd say, no, I don't want that on my wall. It's screwing the wall. So then what would happen? They'd give her an opener like this. One of these type of openers. And that's the way they started marketing the product, was giving away some so you get some eventually. And that's the way it got started in many, in many parts of the country. I will tell you, while we're talking, hey, I gotta get a drink of water, jeez. <laughs> this is a th thin, narrow bottle. This here is Mexican Coke. This is Coke that's manufactured in Mexico. It has cane sugar in it. It does not have fructose, it has cane sugar. It's a sweeter type of a drink. And I don't know, I, I don't know for sure, but they tell me in New York City where they have these um, pulley sausage shops and, and uh, hamburger shops, that the people there like this better than they like the American Coke because of the sweetness and difference of it. But this here has a tax on it. When it comes in, it's taxed. But it is a product that's still using cane sugar. Excuse me, but Costco sells Mexican. My wife preferred that because when we go to Costco, Right. Yes, right. And there's a code on there so that you know how old it is. Oh. That, that there, it can be drank until February of next year. There's codes on that, little codes on there. Uh, just like bread's marked and all stuff is marked. But anyway, it, it takes a while to get from Mexico to, to here. But anyway, that, thank you for sharing that. His wife likes Mexican Coke, right? Okay, good. All right, so... Coca-Cola is going along, there's a depression on. And also, there are temperance places where they don't want you to have any booze or anything. So, what Coca-Cola, is always use the color red, because red signifies a non-alcoholic drink. You look at any other types of drinks, they do not have a red label like that. And in the olden days, when they had these people out from the government checking on whether they were a liquor or not, they could easily identify Coca-Cola as a non-alcoholic drink. Well, okay, where are we at? We're back at um, World War II. General Dwight David Eisenhower was in charge of the European Front. And White called Coca-Cola in Atlanta and said, the troops want Coke. We need Coke over here. So, the troops were wanting three things. They were wanting Hershey candy bars, they were wanting cigarettes and Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola, cigarettes, and Hershey candy bars. I don't know if you're old enough to remember, but I remember when I was a kid, the Hershey chocolate was very limited. You could hardly get any Hershey chocolate. You couldn't get any Coke because it was all going over. So anyway, they shipped out a ship, a boat load of manufacturing equipment for Coca-Cola. And they put one plant in England, one in France, and one in Germany. And to top that off, they sent over 148 employees to build these bottling plants and maintain them. They dressed like officers. They 
bunked with officers, they ate in the officer's mess hall. The only thing was they didn't have a bar or a star on their shoulder. They had a little emblem on their sleeve that says technical observer. And what that meant was that if something was not going right with those bottling plants, they could go and fix them. 148 guys went over there to do that during World War II. So we talked about uh, the early days. There was another concern very much in Coca-Cola because these other companies were starting to manufacture cola drinks also. And uh, they had what was known as substitution. Now substitution means if I go into your restaurant and I order Coca-Cola and your waitress gives me whatever you're selling and not telling me it isn't Coke, that is substitution. So I go into your restaurant and I order Coca-Cola, they give me some other drink, that is what is called substitution. Coca-Cola is still very much adamant about their product and not being substituted on because they don't want you to think that the taste of whatever you're getting is the taste of Coca-Cola. So there's a difference like that. So anyway, there were quite a few lawsuits on that also. And um, the, well, when I was with the company, I worked, this, I had a job at Coca-Cola before I graduated from college. And uh, I worked in, a, in an area from Joliet, Illinois, to Champaign, Illinois, to Bloomington, Illinois, to Rockford. And that was my area to develop new business for Coca-Cola. Then I got called into an Air National Guard unit, and I, when, when I returned from that, I um, went to Northside Chicago, and then I was blessed to be able to work the Loop. The Loop at one time, Bronx, New York, the Loop, and Hollywood, California were the largest sales areas of Coca-Cola syrup in the country. And the Loop was quite an experience, but the Loop today is not like the Loop was then. So anyway, uh, I worked that market, and I worked the uh, ballparks, the racetracks, and there were in those days, now maybe you can remember, drive-in theaters. Anybody remember a drive-in theater? Okay, boy, they sold a lot of Coca-Cola. Popcorn and hot dogs and Coca-Cola. So anyway, those are some of the markets that I worked. Now you can say, well, heck, anybody can sell Coca-Cola, it's so advertised. That is true. But there's a lot more to it than just going in and introducing yourself and asking them to buy Coke. You got to design the equipment. You got to design the advertising. Some people want the dispensing equipment in the kitchen. Some want it out here on an island. Some want it over here on the wall so you can push the serve yourself. And there's a lot of piping, and I was talking to, to David about that earlier, the lines and all that complicated equipment. So it's, it was not that easy. Plus we had to design programs for everybody. So we're talking now, we, we got into substitution, and substitution, if a guy, if a, a person owned three or fewer arrests, Coke would never go after them because that would be bad publicity to have a giant company, company Coca-Cola going after somebody that's got three coffee shops. But as these chains developed, and you don't know who owns all the chains, they started substituting and Coke would go after them and they'd say, you're substituting on our product, you got to cease and desist, cease and desist. Now, if, if the guy has in his store a sign that says, we proudly serve Pepsi-Cola, then it's my fault that I didn't get that. I'm a victim there. But if you go in there and you get something that isn't Coca-Cola, that is what we call substitution. We used to keep track of those. Two young lawyers would come out of Atlanta a couple times a year dressed in nice blue suits, white shirt and a blue tie and they have a flask in their pocket. They would go to these restaurants that we asked them to go to to check on three times in a day, morning, noon, and if they were open in the evening, in the evening. Okay, they order Coca-Cola, and if they get a drink, they would put a part of that drink in their flask in their pocket, and they take it down to 1032 South Pulaski Road, 
which is where the chemistry department was for Coca-Cola, and they could easily identify whether it was Coke or not. So, if it was another product, then they would pass it back to us in the sales management end of it, and we would go back and again try to get the people to, to buy uh, our product. And many times the idea was, well, John, you you like Pepsi Cola, that's fine. Why don't you put in Coke alongside of it, and then people that want Coke can get Coke, people who want Pepsi can get Pepsi. We knew over a long haul that they'd be selling a heck of a lot more Coke than, than Pepsi. So get, little gimmicks like that is how you try to get the business back. So back in the 20s and 30s, they started advertising, and uh, this was before then, actually. This was early on. Uh, we got this somewhere at a fair. And what that says is, drink Coca-Cola, it says something like, call for the genuine Coca-Cola and make sure that you get it. Now they would put these signs up on, on billboards or on stores, storefronts or wherever, to let people know that there was such a thing as a genuine Coca-Cola. And that bottle on there, when people got using soda fountains a lot, If you had a restaurant and you were using Coca-Cola, we'd give out uh, trays like this. This is Betty Girl. Betty Girl, this gal here, was an opera star. And she wasn't the only one they used, but they used her quite a bit. They used her with National Geographic, Saturday Evening Post, calendars, print advertising, and on trays like this. So. If you had a restaurant, someone would probably give you a dozen of these or so for your waitresses to serve the food and the drinks on. This is Betty girl, same lady. Now this here, what they would give these to restaurant operators or bars, they were called a change tray. In other words, if I come to you and I give you $5 and you give me change back, you'd put them on a little tray like this, get your change. Otherwise, you could consider this as a tip tray. Put your tip on the tray like that. So these were little pieces of advertising that were used early on in the manufacturing and marketing of the Coca-Cola company. So, you go to McDonald's or any fast food place and you're gonna see right now a battery of these, about 15 of these valves like that has a header on it like this it'll be something like this well one part of our job was quality control and as i said earlier coco is very much on the quality control this valve here is an electric valve and when you go to mcdonald's and you push that lever you're going to get water and syrup coming out of there, out of the back of this. It's designed, I don't know if you can see or if you want to see, but the point is, the reason that I bring this along is, one of the things that we'd always do with the people was to uh, ask them if we could check the drink. So, I would come to you, Mrs. Coca-Cola, and I'd say, I'm Dick Volker of Coca-Cola Company. We appreciate your business. Can we do anything to help you? How's the distribution? You getting the syrup all right? How's the advertising? Do you need anything? Can we help you in some way? And oh, by the way, can I buy a Coke from you? You always use the word buy. You always use the word buy. And she'd say, sure. So 
And the reason they would say buy is they never wanted us to take a free drink because it would like look like you were cheap, that you couldn't afford a quarter drink. And you had an expense account to put it on anyway. So we would say, I'd like to buy a drink. She'd have a waitress bring me a drink. I said, oh, well, I'm here. Would it be okay if I checked the quality of it? Sure. So I'd take some of that and put it on this little glass here. This here, by the way, is a refractometer. Very expensive piece of equipment. And what it does, it measures the specific gravity of sugar. So we're in this lady's restaurant, and we're checking the Coca-Cola. Put a speck on there and play like you're a pirate. And uh, if it's at 13.5 sugar specific gravity, that's great. So what if it's light, if it is not 13.5? Oh, your drink is a little light. Uh, you're probably going to be, it would be better off if we adjusted it some, because people are going to realize they're getting a light drink and they're not going to order as many from you. Can I adjust it for you? Sure. So then it's hard to do with three hands. But anyway, you take this here. This here is a syrup separator. This nozzle there is a syrup separator, and this is a cup, obviously. And you would check them so that the uh, syrup went in the smaller side and the water went in the large size there. And what that would show would be, if it was equal across there, you had as much, it, it was right where it should be. You had one ounce to five ounces anywhere up and down there by adjusting that like so. Now you're wondering, why in the world are you showing me this? The only reason I'm showing you that is that's a part of the company's interest is giving you a good quality drink. So on the other side of the coin, maybe your drink is too heavy, too much syrup in it. Then I would suggest that we cut it down and not have as much syrup in the drink because it's costing you yield per gallon of syrup. In other words, you're not getting as many drinks out of a gallon of syrup as you should and that's costing you money. So, can we do that? Okay? Okay, so now we're adjusting that syrup so that she's getting a good quality drink and uh, that's what's very important. We want the clients, the customers, whatever you want to call them, have a good quality drink. So, we go back to uh, talking about how we're going to sell people that are on other other company products. One of the things that, if you've ever been in a nice restaurant, I'm sure all of you have been in nice restaurants. You go in a nice restaurant, they have a nice plasticized menu, big menu. Well, usually they change those about three times a year because of changing products or changing prices. Changing prices is the main reason. Those menus cost whoever it is, the restaurateur, the bar owner, a considerable amount of money. So what I do, I go in and I say, John, if you put in Coca-Cola, we will pay for you to have your menus done. You go and you have your menus done where you want to, we'll take care of the cost of it. Now, you ever go in some of these better restaurants, you look on the back side of the menu and there's going to be a little bullseye down there it's going to say either Coca-Cola, Pepsi-Cola, or Budweiser. And you know who paid for the advertising. One of those three companies usually would be the ones that would pay, pay for the advertising of that. Another thing that uh, I used uh, that was unique, anybody a baseball fan? This is all basketball, football territory, isn't it? Well, anyway, there used to be a guy by the name of Joe Pepitone. Anybody remember Joe Pepitone? Joe Pepitone was a first baseman with the New York Yankees for quite a while, and then he, some way or other, he ended up with the Cubs for a couple of years. Good looking, tall, thin, sharp guy. All the girls liked Joe Pepitone. Well, he built a bar, what I call a grab joint, not a grab, a meat market, he, a gin mill, he built 
down in a basement on Division Street off of Rush Street, where all the activity is about this time of the night or later, he built, you step down four steps and you're into his bar. So I says to Joe, you know, you're gonna, he was serving food there also. I said, Joe, you're gonna be having families come in and they're gonna be wanting to bring children in and look at all the pictures all around of the ball players, get your signature or picture with you. Tell you what you do, you put in Coca-Cola and I'll have some bats made up for you so that you can give the kids souvenir bats of being in your restaurant. So he went for that idea, he liked that idea. And on one side of this bat, it says Joe Pepitone's Thing. He named his place The Thing. Joe Pepitone's Thing is what he called it, 12 East Division Street. And on the other side of the bat, it says Coca-Cola. So we got our advertising on it. See, one side it says Joe Pepitone's Thing. That's the name of the place. And the other side says Coca-Cola. So these are little ways that you got into people that you might not get their business from. Anybody heard of Fort Sheridan? <laughs> Fort Sheridan was when you went into the army, that was the first stop. You learned, you learned where to march and where to obey. And that was at Fort Sheridan. So. It's on Green Bay Road, up near Waukegan. One day, I'm going up in that area, and about three blocks from Fort Sheridan is this footings in for the, a building on a corner. And it looks like it's going to be a restaurant. So I stop and I talk to the guy, and he said, yeah, we're going to, we're just going to be a McDonald's. I said, well, then you're going to be using Coke, because all the McDonald's are no, we're going to use Pepsi. My daughter likes Pepsi, and she's going to work here. So I left my car and went on down the road. About three weeks later, I go by and he's got the walls up. So I'm a bulldog. I stopped again and talked to him. Yeah, I said, we're going to go with Pepsi. I told you that. So I went on. About a month and a half later, everything is in there. I go by the, the tables, all the back bar area and everything is in. So I stopped again and talked to him. He said, no, we're going to use Pepsi. So. One Monday morning in Niles, Illinois, which is where our offices are, we had a regional meeting, and after the meeting was breaking up, the regional manager says, well, anybody got any questions or any problems that we can help you with? And I told him just what I'm telling you. He says, Dick, don't you bother that guy. I said, what? He says, antitrust laws. Antitrust laws, Coca-Cola wants nothing to do with antitrust laws. They mean that you got a monopoly and that you can be sued because you've got a monopoly going. So I don't know whether that guy is still in business or what, but I did not go back there because it, we didn't want, I was told not to go back there. But the idea was if you have a monopoly in any kind of a thing, you can be sued for an antitrust law because you're not letting another person have an opportunity to sell in your place of business. So that, I, I learned that. So we talked about bottles, we talked about the advertising materials, we talked about legality, and we talked about the formula. As I said earlier, depression was on People in the 30s could afford a nickel for a Coca-Cola, and that helped the business keep going also. And then after, um, after the uh, prohibition left off, while the beer and everybody was back in business. There was, and it's, it's true, up in Evanston, Illinois, which is where Northwestern is, they had an ordinance in, they went to call the Women's Christian Temperance Group. Now this is back in the 40s. Women's Christian Temperance Union, and they put an order, they had made into that town's legality or ordinance that you couldn't have carbonated drinks on Sunday. They felt that carbonation or sparkling water was sinful. And it was a spirited drink like wine or booze. So they put that law in. And you know how the ice cream stores and the soda fountains got around that? They came up with the idea of taking a dish 
and putting in that a dipper of ice cream, pouring chocolate or strawberry over it, and they called it a sundae. That's how you get the name chocolate sundae, or sundae, or whatever you want to call it. It was because of this, these people being smart enough, they just put some ice cream in a dish, put a topping on it of some kind, and that got around the idea of carbonation on a Sunday. So that, that actually, so that actually happened. Uh, Lindsay asked about Coca-Cola and the taste of Coca-Cola. I don't get 10 cents for telling you this, and I will tell you this, because I have a lot of respect for them. You go into a McDonald's, and you get a cup of coffee, and it tastes different. You go into McDonald's, and you get a Coca-Cola, and it tastes different. The reason for that is, if you ever get a chance or want to go into a back room of a McDonald's, or in the basement, usually, they have the most super water filtration system that you could ever want. They take out all kinds of sediment and stuff that's in water. And I've had ladies tell me, well, I, get a, I stop at McDonald's in the morning before I go to work and get a cup of coffee because it tastes so much better. And that is because the water is so much more purified. And so that is why the, you might find a different taste. I've told you my story. Now, who's going to share their story of when they were 10 years old and introduced to Coca-Cola. Well, you, you okay, thank you. My father and his brother went around with their little red wagon selling Coke. Good. And we don't know when it was. It must have been in the 20s or 30s. 1920s. Thank you. Anybody else got a story about Coca-Cola? Well, I grew up on a farm, and my dad had, in those days, you didn't have combines, you had corn pickers. And the snoots, or the snouts, or whatever you want to call them, the corn picker, they'd get a rust on them. And he'd take Coca-Cola and dump it over there. And they'd keep saying, well, that's Coca-Cola, it takes rust off. The idea was it took rust off because it had carbonation in it. You can do it with 7-Up, you can do it with anybody's product. The carbonation is what was taking off that uh, rust. I thank you very much for your attention. You've been a very attentive audience, I appreciate it. If you want to come up here and look at these things, you can. The last thing I want to mention, this lady is a Coca-Cola collector. There are Coca-Cola collectors, and they collect bottles, and they collect signs, and they collect uh, advertising, things of that type. And they, they trade back and forth, and they sell back and forth, and all that stuff, this equipment. So there are a lot of serious people that are in the collecting. Now, it used to be, it used to be that on the bottom of the bottles, there would be a name of the town where that bottling was done. Like, we'll say like mine on Princeton, Illinois, they never did it, but Princeton, Illinois, we'll say on there. And there were guys who would collect these. They'd collect these from all over where they'd been and they got these bottles. Well, back in about the middle 70s, by then, most of these bottlers, they had grandchildren who were actually entitled to run the places. They were all fat cats and they lived in Hawaii and they didn't want anything to do with Coca-Cola again. So the company bought back most of these bottling plants in America. Now this stayed here this family that's got this one here, they've kept it on and they do a terrific job in this state and they're getting into Rock Island, Illinois and some of the other states too. But your bottles now that you get, they do not have any name of a town on them. They quit that when the parent company started buying back the, the bottling plants. And so some collectors have those. There's a guy in Glen Ellen, Illinois, it's got three walls cubby holes like in a post office, he's got these bottles sticking in there all the way around there because he's, he was a Presbyterian minister and he'd been all over and he had all these bottles and when he died his wife didn't know what to do with him. She says to me, she says, you, what do you want to do with these bottles? I don't, I don't want anything to do with them because by the time you get the right crowd to come and you advertise for the right crowd to come 
to look at those bottles and possibly buy them. You're going to have a heck of a lot of money in advertising. I'm going to get my 20% for auction and all, and you're going to be very mad because you didn't make much money yet. So I don't know what she's doing. But the only reason I'm telling you that is if you had any collection of them, some of you may have bottles that got names on them, like Cedar Rapids or whatever. And that was the way they did it in those days. So I thank you for coming. And I appreciate and enjoy your company and uh, have a holiday, great holiday. You're welcome. Thank you, Dick.